Okay, welcome everyone to today's webinar on Photoshop, Questions Answered. We're uh, indoors hiding from the snow here in New York City. We got quite a bit of snow overnight and through the morning, and uh, now it's turning to rain. So I think, so, I think things are going to get a bit sloppy out there. So it's good to be indoors talking about Photoshop rather than uh, trying to get out there in the snow. Thank you everybody for joining us today. We're going to be answering questions that were presented from reser uh, submitted from readers of the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter, and so I thought this would be kind of a fun and interesting, hopefully, method of getting some answers sort of in real time for one thing, and also with uh, the ability to kind of see what's going on and get some commentary, etc. Renee will be monitoring the chat in the meeting, so if you've got a question or if there's anything going wrong feel free to chat and she can reply directly through that chat or if need be she can let me know if there's a follow-up question or something like that that I need to cover but otherwise we'll just dive right in the first question actually is sort of a non-visual you might say uh, only because in the context of a webinar I'm not really able to show you multiple displays but we can simulate that a little bit and the question is whether or not I still use a dual monitor setup with Photoshop and if so what I place on each monitor and in my case, I actually don't tend to use a dual monitor setup, a multiple monitor display, all that often, in large part because it seems I'm never home. I'm always traveling, and so I'm using my laptop most of the time on the road for accessing my images and getting my work done. And so in that context, I'm not really able to use multiple displays. But when I'm home and working on a project, then I do like to take advantage of multiple displays. I'll kind of sort of simulate that here for you for just a moment. The key thing that I do is to take all of the panels that I want to have access to and just drag them out so that they're floating panels. And then that includes, by the way, the toolbox where we can access the various tools. You can drag the handle and just essentially rip it away from its docking point. And now we have these floating panels so I can still access all of my controls but they're of course floating panels obviously in this case we're seeing all those panels blocking up my photo but if you imagine we can drag all of these panels right off of my primary monitor display and if i were working with multiple monitors right now i could drag the individual panels all the way off the display over onto my secondary monitor and you can probably get a sense here that if i were to actually do that at the moment then we would be left with, for all intents and purposes, just the actual image here. I can even take the options bar off if I'd like and take that over to my other monitor display. And so that gives me the ability to really focus my attention on just the image with all the other panels and accoutrements sent over to the other display so that I just look over to the other monitor and work that way. The other thing that I will leave on that other display is Bridge, if I'm using Bridge to access images, or if I'm using Lightroom just to send photos over to Photoshop, then I would do the same thing, have Lightroom over on that secondary display so that on my primary display, all I have ideally, or at least for the most part, is the image itself, and then I can just grab my tools or settings or whatever it is that I might need from that secondary monitor. So it is really, I think, a very powerful capability in Photoshop and something that's worth taking advantage of. I find that a lot of photographers either don't know about it or don't bother setting it up. And if you, you know, often if you're replacing an existing display, you might as well keep that old display as long as it's still working and set up the new display as your primary, secondary display as, of course, the secondary, and then work with those multiple displays. I find that even if you have an ultra high resolution monitor display, having those multiple displays, for me at least, I like to be able to sort of compartmentalize some of the information. So being able to take things that I don't really need at the immediate moment and move them over to the other display, just kind of breaking things into multiple pieces, I find for me at least makes it a lot easier to kind of keep track of what I'm doing and to stay focused on the task at hand. The next question relates to the use of the crop tool in Photoshop. And in Photoshop CC, we've got a crop tool that's a bit different from in previous versions. Uh, in CS6, they initiated those changes, and there's some new updates in Photoshop CC. And it's sort of a mixed bag. A lot of photographers find that they very much prefer the new behavior of the crop tool in Photoshop. It's a bit more similar to the crop tool we find in Lightroom, for example. But of course, we've been using the, you know, what I'll call the old version for quite a while. And so 
I think that you know a lot of photographers have gotten accustomed to that and are not really crazy about some of these changes. It, it feels a little uncomfortable. But the specific question that was raised regarding the crop tool relates to the ability to resize. And so they indicate that you know previously they were able to crop an image to a height and width in a specific resolution so that they could crop and resize all in one step. And you'll notice I've switched now to the crop tool up on the options bar it does not appear that we actually have that option anymore. We have a width and a height ostensibly, and so we can adjust the ratio. So if I want an image to be, you know, in this case, maybe the equivalent of an eight by 10, I can set 10 by eight as an aspect ratio, and you can see that my crop now defines that new aspect ratio. It's a little bit closer to a square rather than a rectangle. But if I apply this crop, I'm not going to have an image that's actually 8 inches by 10 inches. I'm simply going to have an image that is cropped to an aspect ratio of 8 by 10. If I actually want to resize this image as part of that process, then I need to also specify a resolution. And at first glance, it doesn't seem that that's actually an option here in Photoshop. Uh, in the later versions of Photoshop, the trick is to click the preset pop-up and you'll see that we have a variety of presets that define, for example, here's 8.5 by 11 inches at 300, and, uh, 300 pixels per inch. Well, we also have the option to simply specify that we want to define a specific width, height, and resolution. So if you choose that option, now you'll see that we have three boxes available here. So I'll go ahead and type 10 once again. The default is inches, so I don't have to type anything else there. Just 10 will give me 10 inches. I could also use PX rather than IN for pixels. I could use CM for centimeters, for example. And I'll go ahead and plug in 8. But then when we get over to the third field here, that option is pixels per inch. You'll notice we have a pop-up. We could switch that to centimeters if we're so inclined. And then we can specify the number of pixels per inch that we want to use. So in this case, maybe I'm printing to a photo inkjet printer and I want it to be exactly an 8 by 10 inch print. I can specify using that width, height, and resolution option a specific width, height, and pixel per inch resolution. And therefore, when I actually crop this image, it will be both cropped and resized to that exact pixel dimension. Just keep in mind that that obviously then is a destructive adjustment. We have the option to not delete the cropped pixels, which means basically anything that falls outside the crop box should just be hidden from view but not actually removed. By default, we're not applying a destructive crop. We're not actually deleting pixels, and we may not want to resize as part of that process unless we're specifically preparing a derivative image for printed output. And so just be aware of that, but the point is that we do have this option to actually apply a resizing as part of that crop. I'm going to switch to a different tool here and then come back to the crop tool and you'll notice that those settings, even though I didn't apply the crop, those settings are sticky. And so if this is your preferred method of using the crop tool, including that resolution so that you can resize, simply set it once and then in the future just come back and change the numbers as needed or you can click the reset button over there on the far right. But you'll notice because I've set that particular option, it is a sticky option. It'll it will remain that way for future use of the crop tool until I change it again. All right, so moving on to the next question. This one is an interesting one uh, and one that I've run into from time to time, situations where I capture an image and maybe I was trying to minimize depth of field, but it didn't quite work out as I was hoping. And that is how do we blur the background without blurring the subject? Now, conceptually, this is actually somewhat easy. I'll go ahead and just make a quick rough selection. I'm just using the quick selection tool. I'm not going to worry for our purposes here today about whether or not it's an absolutely perfect selection. I'm just going to make a selection of this guy atop Notre Dame in Paris. And then I'm going to invert that selection. So I'll go to the select menu and then choose inverse. And now I have a selection of the entire background. But if I were to blur that background, I'll just go ahead and choose one of the blur filters here. We'll just go to Gaussian blur, for example. And I'll apply a strong blur to that background because I really want the background to be blurred. 
but you may be able to see here along the edges of this little statue. I don't remember if this one's a grotesque or a gargoyle. I think it's a grotesque because it is not a rain spout, but I forget the particulars there. But you can see that we have that sort of brownish haze, that halo going around this little statue. And that's because while I'm only blurring the background and not the statue here, in order to blur, we're averaging pixel values together. And so Photoshop essentially needs to cross that boundary of the selection to average together pixels from, in this case, for example, the sky and the little statue. There is a way to work around that, but unfortunately, it's a little bit time intensive. It's a little bit time consuming. You could create an action that would help improve the situation a little bit, but uh, it will take a little bit of extra time. So I'm going to cancel here. And I'm going to start off by creating a copy of my background image layer so that I can work non-destructively, essentially. I'm not actually harming the original pixels. I'm just uh, applying changes to a duplicate layer. And so I will then ap apply a blur, but in a sort of stair-step fashion. So what I'll do here is apply a small blur. I'll go to the filter menu, for example, and we can apply a small blur. So for example, maybe just one pixel or a two pixel blur. So now I've applied a very slight blur to the background. Of course, a blur that's so slight that it's virtually meaningless. But then what I'm going to do is back that selection away from the statue a little bit. So I'll go to the select menu and then I'm going to choose modify and I'll either use expand or contract as the case may be. But in this case, I want to contract. I want to pull the selection away from the statue. So I'll choose modify and then contract and I can specify by how many pixels. Normally, if I really want to try to get a nice smooth transition, then I would contract by one pixel and then apply the blur by one pixel once again. So I will repeat that process. In this case, I can use the Gaussian blur option up at the top and I get this question fairly frequently. So a little bonus question here. If you see a filter up at the top of the filter list, what that means is that this is the last applied filter and you can apply it with the exact same settings that you used previously. So I would say that under normal circumstances, you probably don't want to use this option because you probably don't want to use the exact same settings without being given the opportunity to change the settings. But for this particular situation, that actually works out perfectly fine. So I'll choose Filter and then Gaussian Blur up there. You'll notice I could press Control F on Windows or Command F on Macintosh to apply that filter. That will apply one more pixel worth of Gaussian Blur. And so then once again, I can go to the Select menu, Modify, Contract. And then after choosing that command, you'll see that the one pixel value I applied previously is sticky. It's still set there, so I simply click OK. And over a period of time, you'll see that the blur gets stronger and stronger for the background, and the selection pulls further and further away from the object that we're protecting. And so that gives us this tapering off effect that will give us a tapering off effect for that background. So we're transitioning that blur. All right, so let me go ahead and pull that selection back a little bit further. So select, modify, contract, and just for illustrative purposes, normally I would want to make sure that I'm using a very small value as I gradually pull away, but I'm going to go ahead and set that to 10 pixels, for example, just so that you can see after this would be a grand total of 12 pixels, I've pulled that selection back. You can see just a little bit of a gap. I'll go once again and contract and I'll just use 50 pixels here and that will pull that selection back and so you can sort of imagine I won't take the time and bore you with applying that very subtle blur with a small contraction of the selection over and over and over again I might need to perform that step maybe 25 50 100 times depending on how much of a blur I want for that background but you can see that gradually I would be pulling that away. And that means that the pixels very close to the statue, for example, will not be blurred quite as much, but will get such a smooth transition across the area around the statue in this case, that that won't be problematic in most cases. So that's the technique that I use for blurring that background. In some situations, depending on the particular image, you might be able to 
essentially extract the object, duplicate it onto a separate layer, blur the background, and then maybe resize that background or enlarge the gargoyle, for example, so that we have a little bit more flexibility. I'll give you just a quick demonstration of that. I'll go ahead and step backwards here a few steps and we'll go back to where we had the gargoyle itself selected and just for illustrative purposes I'm gonna go ahead and duplicate my background image layer and add a layer mask so now by turning off the background layer you can see that I have a layer that is just the gargoyle and then I might apply a blur so I'm gonna turn off the gargoyle layer here for just a moment and then we'll go back to blur and I'll just use Gaussian blur and I'll apply a fairly strong blur here you'll see that once again we're getting that kind of halo effect for the gargoyle I'll go ahead and click OK to apply that then we'll bring the gargoyle back you can see the problem insofar as that blur in the background causing the halo but now among a variety of other possibilities I could actually just transform this layer so I've got my gargoyle layer here and the layer mask is linked to the image layer and so I'll go ahead and go to the edit menu and choose free transform and now I'll hold the shift key while dragging one of the corners so that we keep the same aspect ratio for the gargoyle I can move it around a little bit and with any luck I'll be able to find settings where I'm able to increase the size of the object essentially to cover up that blurred area in the background so a variety of approaches that we could take depending on the circumstances but generally speaking I find that that you know blur and contract approach is what works out the best so I'll go ahead and close that image the uh, next question that I got actually a fairly straightforward question fairly simple question uh, and it relates to uh, essentially a comparison of Lightroom versus Photoshop and specifically in Lightroom we have a very nice ability to look at a before and after view of our image so while we're working in the develop module we can very easily get a before and after view for the photo in Photoshop we don't have the side-by-side -side compare view that we do in Lightroom but we still have the ability to get a good before and after so a fairly quick and easy little trick here you can see on my layers panel here I have a variety of layers that I've applied to this image and of course I have my original background image down below if I'd like to see only the original layer only the original image I can simply cause only the background image layer to be visible I can do that by holding the alt key on Windows or the option key on Macintosh while clicking on the eye icon to the left of the background image layer and that will cause all layers to be hidden except for that layer so in this case that background image layer so that I can see the before version and then hold the alt or option key while clicking once again on that eye and all of the other layers that had been visible will be brought back into view so we can hold the alt or option key and then just click toggling the visibility of those other layers on or off so clicking once to turn off all layers except the background image layer and then clicking again holding the alter option key in order to get the after so I can kind of just switch back and forth between the before and after view by holding the alter option key and clicking on that eye icon so that works out pretty well it doesn't give you that side-by-side -side comparison we could duplicate the image and then change our view and switch back and forth in that way that starts to get a little bit more cumbersome so this is the approach that I tend to take and I think it works out pretty well because with a moderately quick clicking of the mouse we can get a nice fast switch back and forth between the before and after view so that's kind of that global before and after view another issue that we run into sometimes and I've got a question from a reader is a brush tool that is not working the way you expect it to work I'll go ahead and bring up the brush tool and I'm just going to paint with white up in the sky here just so that we can see the effect of that brush tool I'll go ahead and click and drag and just painting a white streak up in the sky and you can see that the edge of that brush stroke is soft we have this nice gradual feathered transition between the white brush stroke and the background image we have a nice smooth transition and that's because our brush is set to a small hardness setting in this case just a 50 percent hardness I could take that down to zero percent and then I get an even softer result 
or I could take that up to 100% and I get a crisp result. The question in this case relates to when the brush seems to misbehave and causes you to only get a hard brushed result. There are two possibilities that I would put out there. One is the possibility of a problem with Photoshop, which I'll cover in just a second. The other, and I think the more likely scenario, is that you've actually ended up with the pencil tool. The pencil tool is sort of attached to or paired with the brush tool. And so if you're switching with keyboard shortcuts, you might inadvertently switch to the pencil tool. For example, using a shift B instead of just the letter B on the keyboard will allow you to switch between the various tools that are connected to the same keyboard shortcut. If you're working with the pencil tool, you always have a hard edged brush. That's sort of the whole point of the pencil tool, you might say. In fact, if we take a look at this hardness setting for the pencil tool, we still get even at a 0% hardness. So I'll go ahead and click that pop up so we can see a 0% hardness, but I still have a hard edged brush. So this is, I'm sure, the problem that we're running into as far as you thinking you're using the brush tool, working with the brush tool, setting a low hardness value, but still getting a hard stroke with that brush, having no transition at all. And that, once again, is a behavior that is by design with the pencil tool. It essentially always gives us a hard edged brush regardless of the hardness setting for the brush tool. So a little bit confusing perhaps that we have a hardness setting even when we're working with the pencil tool, but that's just because the pencil is essentially just a variation on a theme uh, relative to the normal brush tool. All right, moving on to the next question here. We've got a, a question relating to the lens baby effect. And for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with the lens baby, lens baby is a lens, a group of lenses actually. There's a variety of different lenses available from lens baby. And they create a, an interesting effect. Some people like the effect, some people dislike the effect. I happen to like it in most cases. You can see here with this image of the Santa Monica Pier sign, for example, the center is relatively sharp. In this case, the center, especially near the top, is relatively sharp. But as we move away from the center of the image, you start to see kind of a combination of blur, just being out of focus, as well as a bit of motion blur. And so the question was, you know, a lot of people seem to like the effect of the lens baby lenses. Is it possible or isn't it possible? Surely it must be possible to reproduce the same effect in Photoshop. Now, the answer is essentially yes, but the problem here, I'll go ahead and open up an image. The problem here is that sometimes when we're trying to mimic an effect, we're a little bit too concerned about trying to exactly mimic the exact effect that we see. And if you're chasing a specific effect, things are gonna be a little bit more difficult and you know your tolerance is gonna be maybe a little bit lower. And so I would say, think of this as an approach you can take to produce a similar result. Uh, it's not really a, a method that allows you to produce the exact same result. In theory, you certainly could with enough time to experiment with the different settings. But I would say, you know, just keep in mind that we're not really trying to mimic an exact result or to reproduce an exact result. We're just trying to simulate the basic effect. So having said that, there are two basic filters that I would tend to apply in order to create the effect, both of which I would use in conjunction with a, a layer mask in order to isolate it to a particular area. There's a variety of different ways that we could accomplish this. I could use, for example, a layer group with a single layer mask. I could use smart objects in conjunction with a smart filter and use a layer mask that way. I'm just going to keep it pretty simple in terms of the technique so that we can isolate these various effects a little more cleanly. And so I'll just create duplicate layers for each of the effects. I'll, I'll add basically both of them to one just so that we uh, get a better sense of what's going on there. So I'm gonna start off by creating a copy of my background image layer, just dragging the thumbnail of the background image layer down to the Create New Layer button, the blank sheet of paper icon at the bottom of the Layers panel. And I'll start off with just a Gaussian blur. So I'll go to the Filter menu and then choose Blur, followed by Gaussian Blur. And I'll apply a relatively modest blur. I just want to kind of create that 
faded effect, that sort of fuzzy impact, especially around the edges here. So maybe something along those lines might work well. And then I'll go ahead and also apply a motion blur, but just so that we can see the effect stacked one on top of the other, I'm going to make another copy here of the blurred layer. This isn't a step that would really be necessary. Uh, it's just something that allows me to separate the effects a little more easily when we're taking a look after the fact. There are a variety of things that we could actually do here. We've got for example, a literally motion blur, but that's an angular motion blur. So for example, simulating an object moving across our field of view. In this case, I'm going to use the radial blur. And you'll see that this is a blur that does not give us a preview in the actual photo, which is a little bit of a challenge. That's essentially because this is a rather old filter. It's been around for a long time. But we can adjust the amount. We get a little simulation here insofar as these concentric uh, circles, the lines that define these concentric circles. The blur method I'm going to use is the spin method. And we'll just go ahead and set the quality to good for now. Normally I would probably use best unless, of course, we uh, were wanting to just simulate it in a, in a quick fashion. So here, just in the interest of time, I'll just leave the setting to good. And I'll go ahead and click OK. So you can see here is the image that has had both the radial blur as well as the Gaussian blur applied to it. And then just so that we can see the buildup here, this is the original image. And then if I turn on my first background copy, there's a little bit of a blur and there's a little bit of a radial blur, moderately strong radial blur. If I wanted to sort of blend these effects, I could actually reduce the opacity for the radial blur to kind of mitigate that a little bit. And then I can also use a layer mask. So I'm, in this case, I'm going to use a layer group. So I'll select multiple image layers, in this case, my background copy and background copy two. And I'll click the panel pop-up menu up at the top right of the layers panel. And then what I'm going to do is create a new group that consists of the two layers that I selected on the layers panel. So I'll choose new group from layers from that pop-up menu. We'll just call this lens baby effect. I'll go ahead and click OK. And so now I have my entire effect packaged up inside of a single layer group. I can then add a layer mask to that layer group. And what I want to do is in this case I think define an elliptical shape focused on the center of the image and that allows me to define which portion of the image is going to have the effect visible versus not visible. I'll go ahead, for example, and perhaps draw an ellipse something like this. And then I'm going to fill this with black. So I'll go to the Edit menu and choose Fill, set my Use pop-up to black. I could have created this selection first before adding the layer mask, of course, but this gives us another option for working with the effect. I'll go ahead and deselect my selection, and you can see we've got that lens blur type of effect around the outside, and then the lack of effect around the center of the photo. Of course, we have this, this very, very abrupt transition between the two areas, but then on the properties panel, because I have a layer mask active on my layers panel, I can simply increase the value for feather in order to blend the two together. So this gives you kind of a rough sense of one of the ways that we can approach that type of effect. But generally speaking, using a combination of a radial blur filter along with a Gaussian blur or a lens blur filter, and then using a layer mask to determine exactly where it's going to be visible. And we can, once again, fine tune the effect by adjusting the opacity of the individual layers if we'd like. So maybe in this case, you know, if it's a, this is a bit more of a halo type of effect. In other words, the Gaussian blur was a little stronger than the radial blur, but I can sort of mix and match those two or focus on just using the radial blur if I prefer. But point being is that we can take these various blur filters and create a simulation of that type of uh, lens blur effect. All right, so moving on to the next question here. One, this one relates to noise and specifically how to correct in post-processing with Photoshop banding that's caused by a high ISO situation. So when you have no choice but to capture the image with a high ISO setting, therefore ending up with a fair amount of noise. 
And this actually is a situation where I would say the tool really matters quite a lot. In Photoshop, the noise reduction filter is good but not great. It doesn't do a fabulous job of noise reduction. And so to me, the best approach today, there, there are certainly third-party tools that do a fabulous job with, with noise reduction, but Adobe has done an excellent job of updating noise reduction, but not within Photoshop proper, rather inside of Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom. And so with Lightroom, we have the ability to apply noise reduction. We have that same ability in Adobe Camera Raw. And in fact, as it turns out, the two are exactly the same. Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom's develop module use the same engine for processing your image. So the tools are essentially identical. And that means that we can take advantage of the benefit of the advanced noise reduction if we're using Adobe Camera Raw. In a moment, I'll show you how you can access the same capabilities in Photoshop CC directly. But for now, we'll go ahead and just process this raw image. I'll zoom in on a portion of the sky and I'm sure you can see pretty well that we have a fair amount of noise present there. And so we're gonna take a look at the options for reducing noise that's found in the detail section of Adobe Camera Raw. Now, this is a, an option because I've actually opened a raw capture. If you were shooting in JPEG, just bear with me for a moment and I'll show you how you can access the same basic capability uh, with any image using Photoshop CC. In the detail section of Adobe Camera Raw, we'll find the noise reduction settings. The key thing to keep in mind with noise reduction is that it's always a compromise. You're never going to completely eliminate noise because you would then lose too much detail within the photo. Generally, I start with color noise reduction, and what I do is start to increase color noise reduction, the color slider, but I reduce the values for both detail and smoothness, and then I'll increase until I get to the point that I can see that most of that color noise is gone. And I'm going to zoom in a bit further, and hopefully you can see that we have some colors. Now I know via video stream, it might not be readily apparent to you, but we have sort of, in this area, a little bit of a magenta color cast, and right next to it, an area of green. So we've gone from essentially what you might think of as pixel-based noise to these blobs of noise, to use a technical term. So we've got these you know, kind of magenta and green tinted areas. I don't want to increase color noise reduction so much that those disappear, because that probably is going to lead to other color problems in the image. So instead, I'll just get it up to the point where those start to become less offensive, you might say, and then I'll take advantage of color smoothness. And this is a new slider, uh, new for Lightroom 5 and Photoshop CC via Adobe Camera Raw. And as I increase that value, I realize this might not be very easy for you to see through the video, but that smooths out all of those blobs of color so that we get a much better result. I can also then increase the color detail value in order to bring back some of the detail in the image that was lost. But you can see a dramatic improvement. I'll go ahead and turn off the preview. There's the before version of the image with all of the multicolored noise all over the place. And when I turn the preview back on, you can see that the image improves significantly. In this case, I have some luminance noise. With luminance noise reduction, we need to be even more careful. I'll go ahead and crank this up, and you can see if I get rid of the noise altogether, I'm also getting rid of almost all the detail. And so, again, with luminance noise, we'll really need to compromise in terms of that overall noise reduction. I can, once again, mitigate a little bit with detail. I don't want to bring that up too high. And then also contrast to help bring back some of that perceived sharpness and detail within the photo. Go ahead and zoom out a little bit here and we can see that there's still a little bit of uh, problems with the luminance noise, but in terms of color noise, we've gotten a big improvement. Now, the question specifically asked about banding as well, and that can be a more significant problem. If we have any degree of significant banding, I'll go ahead and crank up my exposure here to see if we see any in this image. In this particular case, not so much. You can still see some evidence of the luminance noise within the image. But sometimes you'll see bands within the image, kind of transitions from light to dark and light to dark going all the way across the image. That is caused usually by line amplification noise at the image sensor level and variations on that. 
And that is a problem that can be almost impossible to resolve. It can be very, very difficult. Uh, Lightroom and Photoshop do a pretty good job with it. Third-party tools such as Noise Ninja also do a good job. And so you might take a look at some of those other third-party tools as well. But noise reduction is always a compromise. And so the way I look at this is if you need noise reduction in the first place, you already compromised in your capture settings. You used a higher ISO setting than you should have, or maybe you underexposed more than you should have, and now you're going to compromise again. And so the best solution is to simply avoid that noise in the first place, making sure that you're not letting the camera overheat, making sure that you're not using a higher ISO setting than you really need, trying to take advantage of the long noise, uh, long exposure noise reduction if your camera offers that option, making sure the camera doesn't get too hot, etc. So those sorts of things can be very helpful when it comes to eliminating the noise or minimizing the risk of noise in the first place. But the simple fact of the matter is that if noise is an issue, it's going to be an issue and it's going to be a compromise in terms of image quality. So moving on to the next question uh, it relates to the use of the difference blend mode as a way to help improve layer masks. And I'll use the example of a composite panorama. In this case, I'll just take a couple of frames of the panorama uh, and just show you one example of using that difference blend mode as a way to help improve your layer mask. It's mostly a tool for evaluating a layer mask and evaluating the overall alignment of the images that you're using uh, to assemble. So in this case, creating a composite panorama, there are a variety of different examples that you could use there. But I'll go ahead and select, in this case, just two images. And rather than using the normal panoramic feature, I'll just load these files as layers in Photoshop. And then I'll manually, oh, Photoshop was busy here, there we go. And then I'll manually assemble the images in terms of their alignment. So we'll give that just a moment to process. And you can see that we have the two images assembled as layers. And then what I wanna do is use the move tool and it looks like the top layer belongs a little bit further over toward the left. And so we have something like about, oh, right about there looks to be a proper alignment within the image. Now, when I'm aligning the images in this way, one of the techniques that I'll often use is to reduce the opacity. You can find that on the layers panel. I'll go ahead and reduce the opacity down to about 50%. And now you can start to see some ghosting. I'll go ahead and zoom in a bit here. And you can see some pretty clear ghosting because the two images are not aligning properly. So with the move tool active, I can just click and drag in order to reposition this image. You can see that when this peak over on the right is lined up properly, the peak on the left is not and that would suggest that I may need to rotate the image, for example. Well, this starts to get a little bit tricky, and using this reduced opacity view can be a challenge. Really, in most cases, I only need to line up the point that's you know about halfway in between the two images. And so if I get, for example, this mountain peak right over there, the tallest peak where this overlap is occurring, if this line is perfectly aligned from one image to the next, I can probably get away with not having the rest of the images line up because you're only gonna see one portion out of each of those photos. But if I do want to apply a rotation, now things start to get a little bit more challenging. So let's take a look at how that difference blend mode can help. I'll start off by increasing the opacity back up to 100%. And then for this upper layer, I'm going to change the blend mode to difference. And that will show me the difference in pixel values between these two layers. So it's taking the top layer, comparing the pixel values to the lower layer, and showing me the difference. And by difference, we mean difference in pixel values. If the pixels have the exact same value, or very close to the exact same value, those pixels will appear as black. And when I say close to, I don't mean that it will show us black even if the pixels don't exactly match but rather it will show us black because we're not able to see the detail. If there were pixels here that are very close to black, but really just a dark shade of gray, I would never really know it because I just can't discern that level of detail very clearly. But we can see a pretty clear indication now of where things are lining up properly and where they're not. 
So I'll go ahead and press Control T on Windows or Command T on Macintosh to enter the free transform mode. And now I'm going to click and drag outside of that bounding box and I can rotate the image. And as I do, you can see, because of that difference blend mode, a pretty clear indication of where things are lining up and where they're not. I can then go ahead and drag to move the image around a little bit. Uh, in this case, what I probably will need to do is to move the center of rotation. So I'll zoom in just a little bit here. And if I move that center of rotation, that target at the center is the center of rotation, I can change the point around which I'm rotating the image, and then I can fine tune. So I'll adjust the position with my arrow keys, and then maybe rotate a little bit more, and adjust the position with the arrow keys. And what I'm usually going to do is try to get things as close as possible. Ideally, I wanna see all black here. Well, that might involve applying some rather dramatic transformations. In this case, for example, the images were captured with a wide angle lens, and so there are going to be a variety of distortion issues at play, uh, but I could you know, continue applying those various transformations. But again, you can see that thanks to that difference blend mode, we're able to get a pretty clear indication of where things are lining up and where they're not. So I'll do a little bit of tweaking here of the image just to try to get things as closely aligned as possible. Right about there. We'll call that good enough for our purposes here today. And then I'll change that blend mode. So I've pressed enter or return on the keyboard in order to apply the transformation. Now I'll change that blend mode back to normal. And you can see it looks like we have a pretty good alignment. You know, if we look at the before and after, so to speak, you get a real clear sense of that transformation that was necessary and we still have some alignment issues. But now if I add a layer mask and then I'll just use a soft edge brush to paint with black and blend in, and if I blend back toward this peak that I was using as a reference, then I should have a pretty good overall alignment. And so I can kind of bob and weave through the image there in order to improve the overall blending. I'll go ahead and choose image reveal all in order to expand my canvas size to show us both of those images. And you can see in this case, you can tell from the angle of the image on the left versus the angle of the image on the right. You'd never guess it, right? This, this image was captured, this set of images was captured without the benefit of a tripod. Uh, and so we have some very clear alignment issues that relate to that. But that's how that difference blend mode can be very, very helpful when we're trying to blend images together in the case of a composite panorama or with an HDR image, composite depth of field. Anytime we're trying to get very precise alignment within the images, that difference blend mode can be very, very helpful. So the next question relates to the use of actions. And this is actually a, a very common issue that I run into, and it relates not so much to the creation of the action, but rather to how you're actually running that action after the fact. So I'll just create a very basic, simple result. So I've got an image here that I've just opened. I'll go ahead and close this image, and I'll close this image for now. And I'll bring up my Actions panel by going to the Window menu and choosing Actions. And I'll just create a new action set that I'll call test actions. And then I'm going to click that blank sheet of paper icon to create an action. So this is just going to be a test action because I'm not even concerned at the moment about the nature of the action. We just want to troubleshoot some issues and then I'll, I'll present the question in a little bit more detail. So I'm creating a new action. I'll click the record button and Photoshop is now keeping track of everything that I do. And so I might, for example, go open up that image that I had just opened, and then I might apply some sort of change. So let's just assume, for example, that I'm making an action to turn everything into an oil painting. And so I'll take the various settings here, adjust the scale, and I'll reduce the bristle detail just so we have this kind of obvious uh, transition of the image from a photograph to some sort of, uh, well, in this case, I suppose a little bit of a warped oil painting of sorts, a kind of smeared effect in the image, but just applying anything in this case. And then I'm going to choose the option to save the image, and I'm going to save it to my desktop with that file name. 
We'll go ahead and save it just as a JPEG at a high quality setting. And then I'm going to close the image and then I'll stop recording the action. So I'll go ahead and expand the action here. And you can see that we have an open command, the oil paint command, the save command, and the close command. Well, this all seems good enough, except the problem and the, the specific question that we ran into here or that the reader submitted is that when they've created an action, then they go to apply it to a different image, they're finding that the action will only open the original image and will only resave with the exact same settings. So in this case, if I try to run this action on a different image, I might end up with the result where it just opens up my lion image and then it applies the oil paint filter and it saves it to my desktop as the lion image. And so I'm not getting the result that I'm expecting as far as being able to process multiple images. So let's go ahead and process a different image. I'll just grab this image, for example, and then I'm going to go to the tools menu and choose Photoshop. I'm in Adobe Bridge at the moment and I want to use the batch command. We can also find that batch command within Photoshop, but in this case, I'm just selecting one or multiple images within Bridge. And here comes the key. So I'm using the photos that are selected in Bridge as the source of images to process with my batch command. You can see that the action is set to the one that had been selected, but if need be, I could go choose a different action set and a different action. And here are the keys. Number one, I need to override the action open command. I get a little alert here letting me know what's going on, but what that essentially means is that if I've recorded an action that includes a file open step, do I want the, the file open step to be reproduced in its precise way, in other words, the exact same image, or do I just want it to be used as sort of a placeholder for this is where the image should be opened? And so I want, in most cases, almost all cases, to have that action only process the selected images and not actually open whatever image I opened when I was recording the action in the first place. I have the option to include all subfolders. In other words, if I had selected a folder as my source to process images in the subfolders, to suppress the file open options dialog. Now what this really means for most of us with most of our workflows is do we not want to see Adobe Camera Raw? And generally speaking, I would say that if you are processing a group of images, you do not want to see the Adobe Camera Raw dialog. It sort of defeats the whole point of batch processing. We want it to be an automated process. So generally I would turn this option on. Also, I don't want to be warned about any color profile mismatches. And then when I save the images, let's say I'm going to save them to a folder. I'll save them to a folder on my desktop and we'll just call this, you know, output for example. That's my output source. In other words, that's the destination for all of my images. And again, I want to override the save as command. You'll notice again, I get this dialogue letting me know about what's going on. But what this means is that when we reach the save step in the action, rather than saving the exact same image in the exact same location with the exact same file name based on our action, in other words, in this case, saving the lion image, Instead of saving that file to that location with that file name, we just want this to be the point at which the image is saved and we want the save settings used from the action. So in this case, I saved the image as a JPEG with a quality setting of 12 when I saved as part of my saved action, when I was actually creating the action. I still want that to be the case. I just want any existing files to retain their file names. And you can see I can apply renaming as well, but generally I would just leave this set to document name and extension. I don't need a serial number at all. If there are errors, I want to stop on errors. But again, the key steps there are to override the action open commands and to override the action save as commands so that we're able to process unique images. So with all those settings uh, set up correctly, I'll go ahead and click the OK button so that the batch processing will begin. Photoshop will then open the image that I selected in Adobe Bridge, even though I opened a different image, a lion image, when I was actually saving it, or when I was opening it, when I was recording that action, it will be saved in the location that I specified with those settings established. We'll leave that one alone. And then over on my desktop, 
you can see that I have the image process. So here is the image with that painterly effect having been applied via an action. So again, those override checkboxes are the critical considerations. All right, we'll address one more question before we close out today. I'll go ahead and clean up my interface here just a little bit. And there was a question, there have been a couple of questions recently in the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter relating to focus stacking. And one of the questions was, isn't it possible to just do that manually, essentially? And the answer is yes, there are some challenges involved, but I'll go ahead and select two images. In this case, an image where the foreground had been the focus versus the background in the other image. And then I'll just load those files into Photoshop layers. And so now, once that finishes processing, we have these two layers on the Layers panel. So the top layer is what we're looking at at the moment, where the foreground here is in focus. And then we have a different image, essentially the same setup, but with the background in focus. And so if I want to essentially focus stack here, I want to take this foreground and blend it with this background, all I need to do is use a layer mask for that purpose. In this case, I'll just paint on a layer mask just to demonstrate the concept, but I'll take my uppermost layer on the layers panel and then click on the circle inside of a square icon, the add layer mask button at the bottom of the layers panel. That gives me a layer mask that is filled with white. So at the moment, I'm only seeing this top layer because the layer mask is white. Therefore, I'm revealing the entirety of this layer and the layer, of course, is opaque, and so it's covering up the layer down below. But if I use the brush tool and paint with black, so I have the brush tool selected on the toolbox. My foreground color is set to black. I can press the letter D on the keyboard for default colors to get white and black, and then I can press the X key on the keyboard to swap out or exchange those foreground and background colors. I'll use a soft edge brush, or at least a moderately soft edge brush, maybe around a 50% hardness in this case. I can adjust the brush size with the left and right square bracket keys. And then painting with black. So I'm painting with black on this layer mask to block the blurry version of the background and reveal the sharp version. So I'll go ahead and just do a rough job here. Obviously, I'm not taking the time to get an absolutely perfect result, but this gets us reasonably close to that perfect result in terms of blending foreground and background. I would obviously wanna make sure that I get the entirety of that background blocked out in the blurred version. In fact, I might take a look. Once I think I'm finished, I can hold the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Macintosh and click on the thumbnail for the layer mask and then come back in and clean up any areas that I need to. So I can see some areas that were still white where they should have been black but you get the sense here that we're able to then blend these two images. So I have a sharp background plus a sharp foreground blended together. And I would obviously want to zoom in and take my time and make sure that I'm blending perfectly. I might need to move these layers around. So for example, using the move tool, I could click and drag this layer around if things were not aligned absolutely perfectly. So maybe, you know, somewhere around there might work well. But point being, we can absolutely focus stack even in situations where we're not doing something like macro where we're really blending many images together to try to create more depth of field. The idea of course is just to use that layer masking but you do need to be careful. I'll go ahead and move this layer out of the way and as we saw in a couple of examples today anything that's out of focus we sort of get a larger blown out and blurred edge a fuzzy edge to it and so it can be a challenge to get things to blend together if we need too much precision so you do want to be careful when you're using this technique it, and if you know if at all possible you want to capture several images this naturally is sort of an extreme example because a very easy example because I have this dominant uh, subject in the foreground and a dominant background and it's a very simple situation where there's a lot of separation between the two areas and so I really for demonstration purposes here today made it super easy on myself so that we could see the concept but if this were a macro shot and we're trying to get you know a bug in focus all the way from front to back and we're taking multiple images to accomplish that now you have a much more challenging layer masking situation on your hands. But when we have a situation like this, 
Uh, another example would be if we had some flowers, for example, and we photograph the same basic setup, but we have, in one case, a foreground flower that is the only flower in focus, and then in another case, a background flower that's the only flower in focus, then we might want to combine those two images so that the two flowers are in focus, but everything else is still blurred. So for those types of situations, by all means, using a very simple layer masking technique will work out very nicely. All right, looks like we've run out of time for today. Thank you guys very much for attending. I hope you enjoyed and found the questions and, answered presented, uh, questions and answers presented today to be helpful. And I uh, hope we'll look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Thank you very much.